Um, welcome to the 2022 Joel Lecture. Uh, I'm really pleased that we've been able to put this one on because, as you all know, we couldn't have one last year. And to make up for that, we haven't got one professor tonight, but we have two. A professor of two subject areas. So I think it's going to be a little bit different from our usual discussions and talks over the Joel Lecture. But I see a few new faces in the audience, and I, I feel really I should explain a little bit about why it's the Joel Lecture and exactly what the Joel Lecture is. So I'm just going to show you, this is the total, by the way, of my slides. I'm just going to show you one slide, which kind of summarises what went on. And I, it might be a bit crowded, so I need to sort of explain what's on this slide. This blue bar here represents things that went on at the Middlesex Hospital at its medical school. And this blue bar down here represents what, what went on at University College Hospital and its appropriate medical school. And the story of the Joel chair really starts back at around about 1745 when, when the Middlesex Infirmary was uh, established. And it was established in, in, in two small houses in Windmill Street which is just off Tottenham Court Road, and for about eight years it remained there, and then the hospital was rebuilt in Mortimer Street, and was there until 2005 when they knocked it down and made it into some very expensive flats. In between all of that, various activities took place, and this is an important date. 1792 is when the Middlesex started to specialise in, in cancer treatment. And the Joel chair is very much tied up with the ideas of cancer treatment. And it was established with a total sum of £400 in those days, which now represents around about £30,000, to establish one ward that would treat cancer patients for the poor. And then we move on to the establishment of the Middlesex Hospital Medical School. And the reason the Middlesex developed a medical school was because somebody over the other side of the road, i.e. UCL, its appropriate medical school, had just got started and they were beginning to steal the students. So in order to avoid that happening, the medical school was established. Having said that, people were being trained from the very early establishment of the Middlesex Hospital. Then I've got this rather long period of which what, lots of interesting things went on, and I'll say just a word or two about these two gentlemen in a moment. But in this area, clearly something happened which was quite important, the discovery of x-rays and, radio and, and radioactivity, which is again very relevant to the treatment of cancer. 1912, the Middlesex Medical School received 250,000, which in today's money is around about 35 million pounds, to establish four chairs and the associated laboratories that would help towards the treatment and, and the development and understanding of cancer. And those were called the Bernardo Joel uh, laboratories. And in fact, when I joined the Middlesex, which was a long time ago, uh, we, I actually joined the, the Bernardo Joel uh, laboratories. And in 1912, they were left a very large amount of money. And in 1913, uh, the first hospital physicist was established at the Middlesex Hospital. He then became the first Joel Chair in 1920. And so the Joel Chair, using the money that was uh, given by the Donato Joel family to establish these four chairs, the Joel Chair was established there. And it is believed to be the first chair of medical physics or physics associated with medicine in the world. So it's a relatively novel situation and hence the reason why we celebrate it once a year. Uh, we then move up to 1986, uh, sorry, 1986, when the two medical schools, University College and the Middlesex, merged together, and hence the Joel Chair moved to University College, because the merging of those two medical schools brought that, that act together. But where did all this money come from? And I just want to briefly tell you where this money came from to give us this equivalent of £30 million. And it is quite an interesting story. These two guys were born in about 1850 uh, in the East End of London, and in order to make money, they used to uh, entertain people in, in, in um, uh, pubs and associated sort of areas. They would, uh, they would carry out songs and dances, they would entertain people in any sort of way they could in order to get some money. In 1867, diamonds were discovered in South Africa. 
Some young lad of 15 years old was scrubbing around in the river of his father's farm, came across a really shiny rock, and that was the discovery of diamonds. Four years later, these two guys decided they could take their entertainment to South Africa to entertain the, the, the miners that were looking after trying to get diamonds out of the mines. They go there, and 17 years later, they uh, managed to build up their own diamond um, company, and they sold out to De Beers for £5.3 million. Pounds. That's equivalent to £750 million pounds today. So it was quite a big amount of money that they then invested in gold mining and made even more money. It's not, a, unfortunately, a very happy story because various other members of the family were involved in this and there were lots of arguments and odd people dying for reasons which people are not too clear. But the net result is that the Middlesex managed to get this large amount of money and create the Joel Chair. And we now celebrate that Joel Chair. Um, I'm going to invite Adam to come and give us a talk tonight because it's a slightly different talk, I understand. We've got music, we've got manuscripts. Not the normal run of the mill for medical physics, but what we, I think we're going to learn is how you can use medical physics to look at other much more interesting things. They also are things that don't move, really, which is an advantage, because sometimes patients move around, which is a bit tricky. Adam, please come and give us the 2022 show. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for um, inviting me to give this talk. You've, you've set me off on a slightly the wrong, um, the wrong thread to begin with, because these things do move, particularly when you put them in a room like this, which is hot and, hot and sweaty. These, these uh, parchment scrolls are, are, are going to hate being in here, so I, I apologise. Um, so yeah, I mean, Robert explained how I've currently got a dual appointment. So my, my, my background is, is in medical physics, but uh, uh, part-time vacancy became available in UCL's Institute for Sustainable Heritage, and I, I'm now splitting my time between those two, those two roles. And so, which is why it's particularly nice for me to stand here and see people from from medical physics and from heritage and from some of the medical and heritage institutions that I've worked with um, in the audience. So I'm going, to, like Robert said, I'm going to try and talk about how I've trying to combine two different areas of science, how I've used medical physics in heritage, and starting to come back the, the other way as well. I've spent a while working out how best to frame this talk, uh, what the narrative should be, but, the, but then Tabitha, um, who you'll meet later on, um, offered to bring some of the objects that we've imaged, and that seemed like too good an opportunity to miss. And so I've, I've, I've largely based the talk around some, some interesting case studies. But I've, I've tried to pull out the narrative of the cross-fertilisation of ideas between medical physics and, and heritage science. Some of these connections are weak, some of them are strong, but I'll try and, I'll, I'll try and, I'll, I'll, I'll try and pull out these connections. What you see on the screen here is just a, an example image from, from each area, which you will meet again later on. You've got optical imaging of the neonatal brain on the left, left and you've got some imaging, some uh, drawings by Leonardo da Vinci on the right. So, Robert mentioned this, and I thought it was worth looking briefly at how I came to be in a position where I can combine medical physics and heritage science. And I can tell this through two stories. So, I've got the, the uh, traditional academic career path, which, which a lot of people here will be able to tell. I, I did my first degree in physics and medical physics in Cardiff, and um, one of the reasons I chose Cardiff was that I was determined I didn't want to live and work in London. So the, the first moment of that story is that your plans don't always work out as you intend them to do. I then did the excellent um, grade A training scheme, which is a two-year hospital-based medical physics um, scheme, where you train to be a hospital medical physicist, but then it included a uh, master's, which I did in, in Bristol and Exeter. My master's project was in ultrasound, and I did that in Bristol with people like uh, Peter Wells, Mike Halliwell, Doug Follett, who a lot of people here will know. Peter Wells gave one of these Joe lectures earlier on in the, in the series. And looking back now, it's, that was probably one of the best places, certainly the best place in the country to learn ultrasound, and probably one of the best places in the country to learn medical physics research. And I probably didn't make as much of it at the time as I could have done, but I did realise that my heart was in research more than it was in clinical medical physics, 
And so I uh, applied for a PhD here at UCL with David Holder and Richard Bayford in electrical impedance tomography of brain, brain function. So what you can see on the right hand side here is slices through the head going from top to bottom, from bottom to top. And the, the bright bit is where we were stimulating the brain with um, a light and showing that the, the, the brain responds in such a way that it can be picked up by measuring the electrical conductivity. I then stepped sideways into diffuse optical imaging and managed to get an EPSRC Advanced Research Fellowship where we were looking at combining optical imaging with other anatomical imaging techniques. And that, I, that's probably best about 15 years ago and, and, and that research which is still ongoing now, it's still an unsolved problem. I then got this fabulous Challenging Engineering Award which was, which, which, which was pretty much a pot of money to spend on what I wanted to do and uh, it was great. Um, and I really use this in two areas. The um, slide, the, the, the picture in the middle is, is one that I used in the interview. It's, it's taken from one of our optical breast images. So the, the contrast here is optical absorption of, or it's absorption of, of light by, by blood. And you can see an increase in optical absorption where the tumour is. Now it's just a happy coincidence that these physical parameters that we measure, whether it's optical absorption or x-ray parameters, they tend to correlate with what the doctors want to know. But what we actually want to know isn't the optical absorption of light, it's the tumour, it's the probability that that pixel corresponds to a tumour or not. And so I was wondering where, how we could move in the direction of imaging the biology of tissue rather than the physical properties of tissue. And it turns out that this concept is probably better developed in heritage science than it is in medical physics. Like some of the colleagues in the Institute for Sustainable Heritage are taking measured parameters from environmental monitoring and using that to predict the lifetime of objects in a collection, when they're going to decay, when you should start to worry about them. And that is using the same concept. It's taking the, the physical or chemical measurements and using that to predict the actual parameters of interest. I also use the Challenge Engineering Award to diversify away from diffuse, opt op from diffuse optical imaging uh, into a number of areas, and two areas became my main research themes, one being radiotherapy and one being heritage imaging, and I'll talk about those later on. I said I had two um, ways of describing my career path, and I'm going to embark on the next one, which is, which is somewhat of an indulgence, but if you can't indulge yourself in a Joel lecture, when can you indulge yourself? So this is my alternative career as an expedition leader. I've, led, I've helped, helped to lead a number of youth expeditions to, to various parts of the world, and I can talk about how they have fed back into my science. This was taken in a forest reserve in Kenya, where I joined a group of people tracking the social behaviour of colobus monkeys. You can see the uh, monkeys in the tree here. We were the first group to be able to recognise all, all the monkeys in the troop. By, by name, so we could follow them through the forest and write down who was doing what to whom as the day progressed. On the right, I'm snorting along a coral reef and mapping out degradation due to overfishing. And uh, both these led in, indirectly to, uh, to uh, publications and contribution to real scientific projects. I was looking back to get photos of this. Crocodiles featured he much more heavily than I realised. On the left, we're um, working on a crocodile farm, weighing the crocodiles and making sure the big ones don't eat the little ones by putting them into a pen for the bigger ones. Um, on the right, this is um, St. Lucia Reserve in South Africa, where the crocodiles were um, diminishing in size, they were starving, and it was felt that there might have been uh, mercury poisoning. So they asked us, we, we had some help, we had people who knew about crocodiles to um, catch a crocodile and take a blood sample. And it turns out we found the biggest crocodile ever measured in this national park. And um, as the resident scientist, I was the person writing down the, uh, the dimensions and the size of the... And the, uh, and the well, we couldn't measure weight because it was too big. These trips normally involve some um, expeditions in the, in the desert involving camels, um, which led to a real highlight of my teaching earlier this year. Um, for a number of years, I've been teaching human thermodynamics, human thermodynamics on Terence's Physics of the Human Body module. And I'd use a clip from a, where a camel's snout is dissected and they show the heat exchange mechanism in a camel. And that clip was presented by Simon Watt. And it turns out that Simon, I found, is now a member of staff in this department. I'm not sure Simon's, I don't reckon I see Simon. 
Simon's not here, but he's a member of staff in this department. And earlier on this year, I did this teaching, I showed this film, and then Simon joined me and we were able to discuss how he did the film and, and why they chose camels and, and just expanded on that. You know, in what I thought was a, a, really, a really exciting way. I'm, I'm not sure that students enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, we try and do a bit of science on the expeditions as well. This is um, taking ticks from a camel. We have some of the camels treated with one anti-tick med medicine and another treated with another anti-tick medicine. And during the expedition, we sampled ticks to find out whether one medicine worked better than the other or not. But on the right, um, this has got an interesting story around it. We came across this abandoned church, um, broken dishes, clearly abandoned in a, in a hurry, with some recent graves out of the back. It clearly had some recent trauma. And um, the graffiti at the back, I say graffiti, it could, it could be intentional, I'd be thinking about this, but the writing at the back says, Watunya Amani, which means people of peace. And we had no idea what had happened to leave this church in this situation. And as I said, the young people were encouraged to do field work. My experience in scientific field work, I was sending them to do astronomy, photography, and things like that. But one of the young people chose to write a story about this, exploring one possible series of events that might have happened to the church being, being left in this state. And that put me in mind of some work we're doing now in a, a new master's programme on heritage, evidence, foresight and policy, where we're looking at how heritage can be used to think about the future. And one method that can be used is by using speculative fiction and writing stories about, that explore what might happen in the future. And it's really nice for me to see that reflected between the expedition world and my new, my new heritage world. But that's, my, that's probably what you didn't come to, to hear about. What you did come to hear about is me talking about uh, uh, medical physics and heritage science. I've clustered these into groups and the first topic I'm, I'm going to loosely call scientific photography. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is radiotherapy. Um, Partly because it brings out some interesting concepts, but also because of, the, of the, this being the Joel lecture and the, and, and the, the Joel legacy being set up for, for cancer. So what are you looking at? So, well, in radiotherapy, we want to deliver a, ra a dose of radiation that's sufficient to kill the tumour, while at the same time delivering a small enough dose elsewhere so that side effects are minimised and, uh, and, and are acceptable. So this needs some careful quality assurance. It's a in its high, high, high precision delivery of, of radiation. A lot of testing of the, of, the, of the machines. And this can take a long time. So we, we started looking at an alternative way of doing quality assurance by taking photographs of the light emitted by a, a radiotherapy beam. Now radiotherapy might use x-rays, electrons, protons. These are all invisible. None of them emit light. So what are we actually doing here? Well, in this case, we're shining a beam of electrons into the top of a tank of water. We're changing the energy of the electrons, and as the energy increases, you can see it penetrates further into the water. Electrons are invisible, but we're taking photographs of it, so what's going on? Well, it turns out that the electrons have got such high energy, they travel almost at the speed of light in a vacuum. They travel faster than the speed of light in water. And if you travel faster than the speed of light in water, you emit light. This is Cherenkov radiation, and it's the same physics as makes a nuclear reactor glow blue. So what, what we're seeing is the glow from electrons travelling faster than the speed of, of, of light. And if we take these photographs and we analyse them and study them, um, we, can, we can work out the, the range, we can work out how far the electrons travel, and plot that uh, uh, energy against the distance for in... In red, our images, and in, in black, the standard me measurements. So we can, we can come pretty close to, this, to, the, to the acceptable measurements for um, penetration of electrons in, in radiotherapy. This looks superficially, similarly, superficially similar, but we've got a beam coming in from the left-hand side here of protons this time, rather than, rather than electrons. Now, protons don't travel fast enough to emit Cherenkov light. So instead of shining through them through a tank of water, we've shown them through a scintillator. That's a plastic block with some chemicals in it which emit light when they're hit by, by radiation. So it looks the same, but the physics is, is a little bit different. And I can actually show you an example of scintillation using this, which is a bottle of tonic water. And if I shine my ultraviolet torch through there, 
you should be able to see the blue glow through the tonic water. So the quinine in the tonic water scintillates. And that's the same physics as what we're using to measure the um, penetration of this um, proton beam. And again, if we change the energy, we get different penetrations and we can, we, we, we can plot out the intensity and work out how far the protons are travelling into the, into the um, scintillator. What you really want to do in radiotherapy, if you want to make big impact, is work with x-rays, because most radiotherapy is done using x-rays. This is a particular x-ray system called a cyber knife, where the, the linear accelerator, the, the device that produces the x-rays, is on a robot arm. And it can target the tumour from all directions, from 360 degrees in, in all ways. And, and a, a, a used for image for treating tumours in, in the brain, and there might be two or three hundred beams all converging on this, on this tumour at the same time. So doing quality control of this is, 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 is really hard. And what we started looking at is whether we can um, record a video as this beam passes through the scintillator block and use that to work out whether the, the geometry of the beam is correct and appropriate. So this is a photo, just a picture showing our camera looking at the block of scintillator in the, um, in the um, treatment room. Now it turns out this is a little bit more complicated than you think it might be. So what we do is... we. Just looking at the simple case now, we've got a single beam coming in from, from the top. And we can um, measure along the middle of the beam, and as we do so, we measure the brightness. And we plot that, we plot the, the, the dose delivered, which is the e equivalent to the brightness, against depth. And you can see, we now no longer get good agreement between our image and the, and the standard measurements. The blue line from our image diverges. So something's going on here. It took us a while to work out what's going on. But what's going on here is that we're shining x-rays into a scintillator block, so we're seeing scintillation light, but we are also liberating electrons that travel faster than the speed of light. So we've got both scintillation light and Cherenkov light going on at the same time. And that makes the, the maths of separating the two out much harder. So Jeremy Ocampo is a PhD student at the moment looking at ways of separating out the scintillation light from the Cherenkov light, either by using a uh, physical uh, experimental method or by training a machine learning algorithm to recognise the difference between the different forms of light. So that's some um, scintillation. It's using photography to look at radiotherapy. Now let's use photography to look at objects. Uh, this is our multispectral imaging system. We've got a camera here looking down through a filter wheel onto the objects, which are illuminated by, by computer-controlled lighting where we can, we can change the uh, wavelength. The next image is, looks rather boring, but that's because it's using ultraviolet light, which neither my camera nor your eyes are sensitive to. So you see very little light coming from the, um, the, the light panels here, but what you can see is a bright, of bright re reflection coming from the object that we're looking at, that's scintillation again, we call it fluorescence in this context, but that's showing that the ultraviolet light can activate the paper and we can, we can, we can then image that as an extra piece of information. So we, I'm hoping this is going to work, we, we illuminate with ultraviolet light and then we step through the, way, the wavelengths of the illumination panels one at a time and we illuminate with 16 different wavelengths. So a normal photograph that you might take with your camera has got three wavelengths in it. It's got red, green and blue. Here we've got something with 16 or 20 wavelengths. So we get a lot more information about the colour. We also use ultraviolet so we can get fluorescence. And you'll see we get further into the red, we eventually get infrared, which allows us to see a little bit, in, a little bit deeper into the object that we're looking at. So the first object I'm going to talk about is this um, music manuscript, which is... Can you provide, I've got, I've got to say, the biggest thanks, Tabitha, Sarah, Katie, and the people from Special Collections who have brought these wonderful objects to look at. But the one I'm going to show, talk about first is, is this one on the front here. And you can see afterwards, you come, 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 come and have a look, that the, the bottom part of it is, is almost completely illegible. It's, it's just erased. And I've, I've blown it up here. You really can't see what's going on here. 
But when we image it with our 16 wavelength system and use a statistical technique called principal component analysis, you can start to pull out the, letter, the, the musical notation and also some writing down here. And we managed to identify the writing as saying, Libera me domine de morte eterna, which is part of a Catholic prayer. Not only have we identified the writing, we've also identified the music. And now is when I pass over to Tabitha, who is kindly going to play it. And I think we can claim, we can't claim this is the world premiere because Tabitha has played this before in a previous um, workshop. But we think that we can probably claim this is the second time this has been heard in about 800 years. It would have been sung, but I'm very bad at singing. Thank you, Tabitha. Sorry for the distraction. The, um, the next thing I want to talk about is um, a really one of the, another one of the things we did quite early on. This was um, reading the name of a person who was buried in an ancient Egyptian coffin. Um, this was work mainly done by Kerry Jones, who um, was going to be here, but she's ill and hasn't been able to make it, unfortunately. But um, it was, this was on a BBC news report. Um, with Palab Ghosh, so I'm going to let um, Palab and Keris tell this story. The hieroglyphics found in the tombs of the pharaohs show the lives of the ancient Egyptians, but the paintings are what the rich and powerful wanted the people to know. They are the propaganda of their time. But now there's a wealth of information about ordinary people being discovered using a new scientific technique. With a specially modified camera, researcher Keris Jones takes photos of a mummy's case at Chiddingston Castle in Kent. You can't see anything with the naked eye, but using infrared, a name is revealed. Ahura Irit Hereru, a common name in ancient Egypt. It's a Stephen or David of its time. It was amazing. <laughs> um, everyone in the room gasped and people jumped up and ran to the computer because in that one image you could read it. So the, the, um the people at Chiddingston Castle have now changed their display to, to um, say the, uh, you know, to present the name of the, uh, the, the person in the coffin, which was, which was uh, really nice. Um, so another highlight was um, this opportunity to image three drawings by Leonardo da Vinci, which were brought to us by Alan Donithon, who's in the, in the, in the audience here. Um, these are properties of the Royal Collection, so I do need to add this rather good copyright notice. The first um, object I'll talk about is this drawing of, a, of, of an arm. This is a study for a painting of the Virgin and Child with St. Anne and the Lamb, which is in the Louvre, and I managed to see both the, the, the drawing that we studied and the painting that it's a, a, a study for um, in a Leonardo exhibition in the Louvre Museum. And you can see this arm uh, being, being, uh, being here. Um, so when we imaged this, we, we focused in, this is Keris again, focused in particularly on this part of the arm here. And one of the interesting things we saw, this was taken under red light. And you, can, you, you don't see much that you don't see under, under um, normal lighting. But under infrared light, you get a little bit more penetration. Infrared light travels a little bit further into the paper, travels beyond the first layer of, of, of drawing. And um, you can see this line here which corresponds to the outline of her arm. So that suggests that Leonardo drew the arm first and then afterwards drew on the, drew on the, uh, the uh, drapery rather than doing the drapery first. Which, to be fair, it's what I would have done, but um, Leonardo <laughs> probably knows more than me about these things. 
This is another, um, to the naked eye, somewhat un underwhelming drawing. It's a silver point drawing, drawn by a silver nib pen on, on a roughened paper. Um, you can see a bit of a shadow of something going on down here, but it's not clear what. But if we image this under ultraviolet light and look at the fluorescence, you see much more detail of interest. It's, it's really startling. Um, and this, this has led us to wonder, may, maybe starts to think about whether they use a different technique for some of the um, drawings down here compared to those up here, or whether it's just, just been stored differently or, or something like that. When, when I think, I'm looking at Alan, I think when we're not still quite sure why these are visible and, the, and, these, and these aren't. One thing that's nice for me is the, uh, that I've been able to translate this multispectral imaging work back into medical physics. This was an um, undergraduate project. This was based on looking at blisters. Uh, they're using blisters as a model for um, allergies and things like that, and one, wondering whether you can get, uh, understand the blood flow, or the increase in vascularization around the blister using um, um, multispectral imaging. You can see, if you use different wavelengths, you, if you use a visible wavelength, you don't see much penetration at all. You're, you're just looking at the skin surface. But if you use infrared, you look through the hairs, through the skin, and you can see the blood vessels underneath. So we're, we're currently wondering whether we can use this as a way of looking at um, skin reaction in radiotherapy to try and, try, try and work out whether people are going to go to a... Some, 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 sometimes you get a debilitating sunburn, effectively, with radiotherapy. And if we know that's going to happen, we might be able to do something to uh, prevent it. So the next area I'm going to look at is, is near-infrared imaging and spectroscopy. And uh, we've, we've been using this in the department for many years. Um, and the reason is that blood is very strongly coloured. We've got a bright colour, so it should be very amenable to detection using, using light. But not only has blood got a bright colour, blood with oxygen has got a very different colour from blood, blood without oxygen. Which means that if you use two colours, you can work out how much blood there is and how much oxygen it's carrying. And this is the basis of pulse oximetry, which is, uh, we probably know a lot more about that now following, following COVID. Um, now, of course, it's important to um, calibrate pulse oximeters and make sure that they're consistent. And for that, we need a suitable volunteer. Most of our work has been in near infrared spectroscopy, has, has been in, in imaging. And for that you need more than one source and one detector, which you get with pulse oximetry. You need multiple sources and multiple detectors. So this is a study we did using, using optical sources and detectors on the scalp of a baby who's about to undergo the heel prick test, so, so about to draw blood from the, from the heel. What you can see on the right is the map that we reconstructed looking across the top of the head here. So the, the cartoon shows the nose at the top. So you, you, this is the midline, you're looking at the right and the left of the head. I'm, go, I'm going to start counting down from five seconds. No, I'm not. I'm going to start counting down from, from five seconds. And you'll see a flash when the heel click test happens. And then after that, you'll see a change in the colour which shows the change in blood within a few seconds following the heel prick test. So this adds to evidence about to what extent babies feel sensation and whether that sensation may or not be interpreted as pain. There's still some debate as to, as, as to whether this reflects pain or not. So we've spoken about using 16 wavelengths. Pre just that, that near fed the cortical mapping was using two wavelengths. Our hyperspectral imaging system can use, up to about, can use about 600 wavelengths. And that's a scanning system that we've used to image, image paintings. So this illuminates an area, but it only detects light from a line on the area. So if you imagine that line consists, consisting of a line of pixels, each of these pixels is split into its spectrum. So each pixel becomes its own spectrum and that's imaged. So for each image we get we get a, what we call a, an image cube. The surface of the cube, if you like, shows what shows the uh, the spatial extent of the image. But then behind each pixel you've got the whole spectrum spectrum. Um, so you, which you can do a lot more a lot more processing on. And we use this to image this painting by um, 
Rossetti, which is called La Girl and Archie, it's held by the Guildhall Art Gallery, and they brought it to us as part of a renovation project. Um, this work was led by Charlie Willard, who's in the audience, and again, this device takes hyperspectral imaging to a new, a new area where we've got both high spatial and high spectral resolution. So we're combining the benefits of photography that gives you high spatial resolution with traditional hyperspectral imaging that gives you high spectral res resolution. Up there we've got the lips from our media. Um, you, put, you don't want to see on the screen what if you put all the brush marks on the bottom of the technique of the painting. Um, with this image, we can extract the spectral profile for an area on the lip So this is an average over this circle of the lip That's one uncorrected spectral profile for this area of the painting. We compare it to this area next to it, which is a different color color on it, and we should see a different profile. So we can scroll through the different techniques here. So we'll see the different features become more apparent as we scroll through these techniques. So we're in the blue range now, going through to the greens and the reds, and up to the near infrared region now. So the problem with when you get 600 wavelengths for each pixel is, is visualising it um, on, a, on a screen. Um, and the, with the there's no good way to, of doing that, really. Um, what, we, what we have been able to do is generate a, a synthetic red-green-blue image. So this is what the picture would look like to the naked eye, assembled from the um, hyperspectral scan. This is the equivalent in the shortwave infrared. So this is using longer wavelengths, again, choosing three to give us uh, a red-green-blue false colour image. And then we can, all, we can process it and pick out areas that are similar. So we co colour code it on, on, on the right, all, all the areas that we think might have uh, associated with a similar pigment. There's still a lot of work to be done in uh, analysing this, uh, this kind of uh, information, uh, image with such a high information content. So now I'm going to talk about this scroll in front of me here. So this is a, um, a six metre long scroll. It would, if we asked Tabitha to unroll it, it would go out, 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 of the fire, out, out of the fire exit down there. And at that end, there's a little randle that's got um, Edward IV's name on it. And it's a genealogy, and it traces the ancestry of Edward IV, back through, back through all the Plantagenet kings and queens of England, all the way back to, at the top end here, um, Adam and Eve. It's a wonderful document. Um, again, our um, hyperspectral imaging is a scanning system, so it's kind of ideally suited to scanning something which is long and thin. And uh, Charlie, again, imaged, imaged this and produced this video as another way of visualising something like this. So we're scanning along the document and at the same time we're scanning through different wavelengths. And you'll see there, different pigments pop in and out as the wavelength changes. So there, you can see, as these, wa as these different pigments pop in and out, we can... We can um, use that to identify that one pigment is different from, an, from an, another. But one of the questions we had was whether this had all been uh, uh, written at the same time. And we can't say it was, it was or not, but we couldn't see any evidence that it wasn't. So if, if the red pigment at the top had been different from the red pigment at the bottom, for example, that would give us an indication that it might have been, might have been uh, constructed at different times. But, but we, we, did, we didn't see any evidence for that. Um, tomography is an area where we've done quite a lot of work in the medical field and also in, uh, and, and I'll also talk about an application in heritage science. So this is a um, baby with, uh, again, op optical measurements. We've got 32 connectors here. Each one acts as a source and a detector of light. So we've got 32 times 31 measurements, which we can use to assemble an image. And we, to assemble the image, we need to know where the light travels through the head. So we've got a computer model that predicts where the light goes, and then we do the, we do the imaging, and we work out what must have happened inside the head to give us the measurements that we, that we obtain, given our knowledge of, of where the light must have travelled. This gives me the um, opportunity to show one of my favourite videos of all time, 
I think this is Topham's hand here, and this is, this is um, evoking movement, the movement part of this baby's brain as we are imaging. So you'll see, um, we image before and after, and look at the difference in the brain before and after we uh, evoke activity. And the image we got was, was this. So th this is a series of 16 slices from the, the left ear going across to the right ear, with the, the nose at the front and the, um, at the back of the head at the back here. And the bit which is bright here, corresponds to that, that here on the brain, which is the somatosensory cortex. That's, that's the part of the brain that deals with feeling and movement. So we're pretty confident that we are localising the blood flow activity to the correct part of the brain that is being activated by, by um, moving the baby's arm. So tomography is the process of creating a 3D image from projections through the object you're probably more familiar with that in terms of X-ray computer tomography. I don't think Robert would forgive me if I didn't show this piece of work. This is the Antikythera mechanism. Um, this is a 2,000-year-old Greek calculating device, which was found about 100 years ago in a shipwreck at the bottom of the Mediterranean, after it had been underwater for 1,900 years. So it's in a rotten state. It looks like they, they brought it up and just thought it was a lump of corroded bronze. And then somebody looked at it more closely or took an x-ray picture of it and saw wheels inside it and thought it looked like something interesting. So then about 15 years ago there was a project that took a CT scanner to Athens and imaged, the, these in multiple fragments, imaged each fragment and worked out that there are a, a, a series of interconnecting gear wheels believed to have 37 gear wheels. The largest one is about 13 centimetres and it's got 223 teeth. All cut by hand, of course, 2,000 years ago. And it's believed, the, the current best, best thought is that it's got dials on the, these gear wheels controlled uh, pointers to dials on the front. And the dials were etched and were able to show the positions of the moon and the sun and eclipses of the moon and the sun and what type of eclipse it was. The motion and position of the known planets at the time and also four different cycles of Olympic Games. It is an extraordinary device, and uh, there's probably nothing of equivalent complexity built for about one and a half millennia after, after this. So where did we come into this? Well, when they, re when they obtained the CT images, the CT data set consisted of a series of images as the object rotated. Each image we call a projection. And we can view these like this. So here, the object is rotated, and, it, and we, we, they took about 3,000 images as the, as the object rotated. This is just an Allen key they put in for, for um, lining up and things like that. But you can see the object rotating. Now, if you watch it closely, as this comes to about 900, I'll, I'll tell you when it gets there if you can't see. You'll see a little jump in the rotation. And that comes in... Any time now, just watch the little jump. There, you see that little, little jump in the rotation. So that happened because the CT system wasn't talking properly to the computer and it lost some of these projections. So some of these projections were, not, were, were either acquired and not downloaded on, or not acquired in the first place. So when they tried to reconstruct the images, they came out a little bit blurry. So this, this is an image that shows some writing on the... The thing's got an instruction manual written on it, and this is, this is some of the writing that, that makes up the, the instruction manual. So well, one of the guys that were part of the Antikythera project, Tony Freeth, came and gave a talk here, and um, afterwards I said, look, medical physics, CT scanning, we know a bit about that, is there anything we can do to help? And he said, well, actually, yeah, there's these missing projections. So I set this as a student project, and um, Ashkan Pakzad, who's here, took this on as, as, as his final year project, and uh, worked out which projections were missing and how best to compensate for them. So Ashkan was able to um, reconstruct um, this image, which is the sharpest and highest resolution image of the world's oldest computer for his undergraduate project, which is not a bad deal, actually. Um, the, the people that look at these things have been able to um, work out that the writing is clearer on Ashkan's reconstruction than the first one, and we've been able to um, read a few letters that were illegible before, but make more letters 
certain that we that we we thought we knew before. What we found, if we're working with these iconic objects, whether it's the Antikythera mechanism or Leonardo's drawings or whatever, they're all very, very well studied. So if you provide more information, you're normally only providing a little bit of incremental information on top of what's there all already. And so in, in this case, we did provide that in, incremental information and the images that Ashkan uh, reconstructed have been used subsequently in other publications. So the last part of the talk um, was laparoscopy, wasn't it? And here we can talk about um, the final thing that I'm going to mention, which is this wonderful book on the front here. So this is a, an, an anatomical textbook um, printed in 1555. So you're looking at something about 500 years old. And it was printed and had a separate sheet. And this sheet had instructions on it telling you to glue it onto another sheet cut it out, and then once you've cut up this page, instructions on, on how to assemble it into a pop-up anatomy. So if you can look at this closely, you'll see the diaphragm is above the spleen, and the spleen's above the kidneys, and the kidneys above the liver, and it, it builds up the anatomy in, in three dimensions. Tabitha asked me if we could look underneath these flaps, because they felt quite stiff, and we weren't quite sure what, what had been going on to assemble these flaps. So we borrowed a, a laparoscope from colleagues in the Vice Centre and peered underneath these flaps and managed to record this video. So the, um, what you can see here is um, these dots here. These dots are hair follicles. So that tells us that we're looking at parchment rather than paper. And the fibres, you can see fibres coming off as well. That's, that's all telling us that we're looking at uh, uh, parchment rather than paper. The other thing which you can see on, on here is this word here, which is phlegmon, which is uh, apparently Latin for phlegm. So that's telling us that this is a medical book, and Tabitha's managed to identify the text that it came from as a 12th century commentary on a book by Hippocrates. So you can imagine this professor of anatomy in 1555 having his new Vesalius book delivered and um, realising that the, this page in here that needs cutting up, going to his bookshelf and taking the 12th century commentary, which is now obsolete because he's got his Vesalius, he, he, he takes his obsolete book down, rips it up and uses it to assemble the new um, pop-up anatomy. Which interestingly, that now is probably the reason why we still have this 12th century text. If it hadn't been used to rebuild this, fifth, this 16th century text, we would probably have lost the 12th century one, as is the way of, of many of these things. So in destroying it, he's preserved it. So that brings me to the end of what I wanted to say about heritage imaging and medical physics. Um, and I hope I've managed to show some of the, some of the challenges and some of the joy of, of doing this multidisciplinary work. Um, it's very collaborative, and that's, that's a great joy, but it does make an acknowledgement slide very difficult to prepare. Um, so I'm not going to try and thank everybody. I am going to thank Robert for inviting me to give this lecture, which has been a, re a real privilege, and uh, Naomi for her skill in organising it. You're all here because of Naomi. Um, special thanks, of course, to Tabitha and her colleagues in Special Collections for uh, bringing the books, being brave enough to... Um, supply them when there's idiots spraying water about. And to Tabitha, of course, for uh, playing her lira. Um, I would like to thank everybody I've worked with, but there are too many. So um, that, that would mean that you wouldn't get the barbecue and the, and, and the, and the drinks. So um, instead, I'm just going to thank those people who have encouraged and supported my dual career, um, especially Jem, Alan, Dave, and uh, my current heads of department, Andy and, and May. And thank you all, of course, for coming, especially those who've come a long way. Thank you.
for those of you that don't know, my name is Anthony Nisbet. I'm the head of the medical physics and biomedical engineering department at the moment, and it, it's my real pleasure to uh, just give a, a vote of thanks. So before I come in and thank Adam formally, I'm just going to repeat the, the thanks to Sarah, Katie, and especially Tabitha for uh, bringing along the um, these exhibits from the special collections and for the musical show. Um, I'm going to look very carefully when Adam asks me to sign off risk assessments just to make sure that I'm, I'm not signing off or underwriting uh, any insurance claims. Um, I will thank Naomi again for the, the organisation uh, and obviously I will thank uh, Professor Robert Speller who is our current uh, Joel Chair. I will actually tell a this isn't to do with, with, with you, Robert, but a, a, an anecdote, because I didn't realise that the Joel Chair was funded through um, adult entertainment, for the one of the better words. <laughs> and given the, the links to cancer and proton therapy, I, I was actually in the proton centre this afternoon. I, I was walking around with, with a colleague and the head of the proton therapy physics group. And I said, I, actually, this, it, it's a bit smaller than, than other proton centres. And one of the reasons is that the Spearmint Rhino Gentlemen's Club had built changing rooms underground, which no one knew about, and they uh, were encompassing, in trespassing on what had planned to be the size of the proton centre. So it had shrunk a little bit. So, so I think that's karma, unfortunately. <laughs> So, uh, so fine, before I, th I thank Adam and make a presentation, just to say that we will be having a reception in the North Cloisters and the Wilkins building, so please do join us there for some uh, food and a drink. Uh, and then that brings me obviously to, to what was a, an amazing talk, uh, a, the, the breadth of work that, that medical physics covers is it, amazing. Every, I, I mean, people who have worked with Adam know how um, passionate and exuberant he is about science and the number of times he, he comes bounding up to my office or I pass him a mallet place and guess what, I'm imaging this this week and uh, it was, I think it was last month, it, it was like trigger on speed and I thought this, this must be really special. It, it was the meteorite that had wiped out the dinosaurs that he was about to image but I'm assuming that's going to feature in a, in a future lecture. Still in negotiation. Still in negotiation. So, um, th thank you all for attending. Uh, and what I've got here is the, is the, the Joel Lecture Medal. So, I'm, I'm going to come down to the front and present this and ask uh, uh, if the photographer can make a um, photo. I'll just swap the lens so I'll keep talking. Um, but, uh, Essentially, what was an excellent talk? It, it, it's really nice to be back uh, face to face, uh, and I think it was an excellent lecture to get us uh, back after hopefully the, the, the pandemic. Um, I think the last one was Gem, which also had a, a musical interlude with the Desert Island Discs. So I, I feel sorry for who I was going to follow. Thank you very much, Adam, for the lecture.